those of you who are present physically. I want to greet those who are streaming with us virtually. I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be with each and every one of you here this morning. I want to invite you, if you're able, to stand with me as we join together in our call to worship. Our big theme this morning is plans, plans that succeed, plans that fail. We'll look at the wisdom of Scripture and the wisdom of God in that regard. I want to invite you to respond with words that are bold and yellow. And we'll follow this up with hymn number 328. God of the past, who has created and nurtured us, we are here to thank you. God of the future, who is always ahead of us, we are here to thank you. God of the present, who is here in the midst of us, we are here to thank you. God of life, who is beyond us and within us, we rejoice in your steadfast love. Turns, 
and our carefully laid plans and dreams come to nothing. We confess that we are quick to give up when things get difficult and quick to question your presence and your power. Forgive us, grant us patience to wait for your good timing, open our eyes to recognize your leading in our lives, open our ears to listen for your gentle whisper when we least expect it, and then give us courage to step out in faith and obedience, trusting in your leading even when we cannot yet see the outcome. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. In compassion, God remembers that we are blessed. In a world where our lives are disrupted by constant change, this remains constant. The steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, to which we say, Thanks be to God. I invite you at this time to turn to your neighbor to give them a welcome and passing of peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Street. Peace be with you, Joe. Peace be with you. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to all who are joining us, presently physically here and virtually as well. Uh, and a huge, huge thank you to everyone who participated in this year's uh, India Gala. The in-kindness donations that came in were such a blessing, as well as everyone who contributed to our virtual silent auction. Um, I do not have a, a total yet today, because lots of things are still coming in, so hopefully by next week I'll be able to tell you um, our total. But at this point, things are looking really good, so we're very grateful for everyone who has, has participated and certainly everyone who helped make it happen. Um, if you did place an order or place a bid on any of the auction items, uh, they can be picked up today in the French room. And if you aren't sure whether you won or not, um, there's people there who can um, help you figure all that out. Also, if you uh, sponsor a school child and didn't pick up your envelope yet, they will have those at the desk in the French room as well. Um, just a reminder that today is the last Sunday to sign up for Peace with Friends. So if you haven't done that yet and you're kind of thinking whether or not you want to do that, do it. It's a good thing. And it's a good thing for us all to come together like that as well. So the sign-up sheet is outside the main office. Um, also, last week we uh, had a little baptism after the 1030 service for Jericho Thull. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we were very excited to welcome um, Jericho and his family into our community of faith here. And then we have one little clip from Chris, and then I'll go on with the rest of the announcements. All right, this has sound. I'll start it over. You ready? Yeah. Here we go. Nope, I won't start it over. I will do this. You ready, Chris? Or Joe? Three weeks ago, we took part in the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention to Alan Dark. This is an annual event designed to raise funding and awareness for mental health organizations with a focus on suicide prevention. Last year, we set a goal of $500 and thanks to donations from people here at Manual, we were able to beat that goal. This year we set a goal of $1,000, and once again, thanks to donations from people here at Manual, we were able to beat that as well. Right now, we are sitting at $1,145. I wish I could think of a better word besides thank you, but really that's the best I can do. I have had to record this video numerous times because I uh, started to get a little emotional and tripped over my words. I know, I'm surprised that I got emotional or something. <laughs> but really, thank you. Um, I could not have done this without the support of all of you here. Um, if you wanted to make a donation, the window is still open. We are accepting cash and check donations until the 14th. If you wanted to do something on a credit card, you're going to that, just shoot me a text or a message on social media, 
and I will help you uh, get that done as well. If all you can do is pray for us, I am more than grateful for that as well. Thank you so very much. We could use all of your prayers. Uh, all of us can. So thank you again. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all in a couple weeks. And uh, God bless. Thank you very much. serious health conditions, so we want to keep Dave and Kathy in our prayers. Also, last week I mentioned that little Ellery Flaherty was having surgery to remove her kidney stones. The surgery was a success, and um, her family said hopefully she'll be here today. Uh, Ken Sherrell had had uh, knee surgery, and last week I said it was a success, and apparently he's had some setbacks, so we want to keep Kent in our prayers too. And then uh, tomorrow, Pastor Rich will be having his bone marrow biopsy, um, and then a follow-up with his doctor later in the week, so we want to certainly keep Pastor Rich in our prayers, too. As long as, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as continued prayers for Jessica and for Jeremy Walter, who are dealing with different types of cancer. Uh, flowers on the altar today are from June Sommerfeld in memory of her husband, Mark, so we thank June for the flowers. And then today, our Ministry of Music was our Ladies Ensemble, and so we thank the, the ladies for providing music today. And then Fellowship Hour Treats, we have Max and Maggie and Terry and Eric, so thank you for the goodies. And then this week, the only birthday we have is Anne Marie, so we want to sing a special happy birthday to Anne Marie, so please join me. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. The only one. Wow. All right, and now before we have our first scripture reading, um, we are going to be bringing on some new members today. So if Penny and uh, Richard can start making their way up, I'll share a little bit about them. Uh, Penny, Penny Norman is joining us from the ENR United Church of Christ in Waukesha. Penny currently works at Kohl's and in her free time enjoys crafting, specifically making maps. And her, Penny's brother Richard Layman. Um, was also a previous member at the ENR United Church of Christ in Waukesha. Richard enjoys computers, painting, and drawing. And Penny and Richard are good friends with Twyla and Michael Bath, who introduced them to our church family here. So, All right. Well, Penny and Richard, we're grateful for your presence, grateful for your desire to participate in our shared mission to shine the light of God's love into the world. Whenever we bring in new members, we like to remind all of our members of what it is that we gather around, our shared mission, our shared purpose, our desire to be a faithful community and a faith-filled community. So we've done different things to remind ourselves of that. This morning, I think, we'll just make it as simple as possible. We'll go back to the 3rd and 4th century and go to this very dense Apostles' Creed, which says a lot with just a few words. It's trying to summarize what it means to believe in the triune God and to work within a church context and believe in God's presence in the present and the future. It says a lot, and I think at times it can be overwhelming, but just lean into it as best you can. So I want to invite you to join with Penny and Richard and myself as we confess our faith together this morning. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, Born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It's always saying a mouthful, but I think the phrase that's most pertinent when it comes to uh, recommitting ourselves is the communion of saints. We believe in the church. Uh, sometimes it's hard to believe in the church, but we do our best to lean into the fact that if God's faith will come together in faith, uh, mistakes may be made, challenges may occur, but we're ultimately going to, in some sense, see the presence of Christ be manifest and grace manifest in our lives. We pray that's part of your experience here and that you're able to join us in that. Extend the right hand of fellowship. It's the official one coming your way. And we're grateful for your presence. God be with you as we're 
members and together on this journey. Jenny's got something for you here. And on behalf of your church family, hugs and love. Thank you. These are from the prayer shawl ladies to know that you are part of our family and you are loved and prayed for. Thank God you. God bless you both. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more quick announcement. Uh, on November 13th, that's in two weeks, uh, we will be having our annual uh, congregational meeting following the 1030 service. So um, we encourage everyone to you know, either come back or stick around for that. That'll be um, right around 1145. And okay, now we'd like to invite Michelle to come forward and offer our first scripture reading. first lesson is Psalm 23. Hear the word of God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Yates does an amazing job of summarizing the wisdom literature of the ancient Hebrews and filtering it through Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' own wisdom literature. And we're going to see that James is going to say things that are kind of blunt, very forward and bold. But he's trying to, in some ways, summarize what it means to walk wisely and walk well with God, particularly in regard to learning humility, which we touched on last week. So I invite you to follow along as uh, I read to you from James chapter 4, verse 6 through 16. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers and sisters. Whoever speaks evil against another or judges another speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. So who then are you to judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there doing business and making money. Yet you do not even know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a menace that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Schedule better by next week. Part of my thinking has been, you know, what can I 
leave people with that will allow them to kind of see God's hand in the midst of all that we're going through, uh, continue to remain committed and, and faithful uh, to the congregation on the whole, give a sense of hope, a sense of confidence, and so forth. And so I thought I would touch on what the scripture has to say on this idea of planning, but you can't do this without realizing if you look at the wisdom literature and all there is about planning in the sacred scriptures, you'll find a paradox that there's not just one message, there's a number of messages, and we want to look at that paradox and the two certainties that always exist in the midst of any plan, whether it succeeds or fails. So I want to begin by just doing this. You can tell a lot about a person's and their personality by their response to this one word, all right? I'm going to look at you as I say this, your response to this word, plan. Now some of you get just, you light up. It's like, oh my gosh, I've got a list in my pocket right now, Pastor. Uh, I know exactly where I'm going the rest of this day. In fact, not just today, but next week and next month. I've got, I've got it all planned out. And your eyes light up, and that's a wonderful thing. It just shows that your personality, you're more inclined to finding security and having confidence and having a detailed plan for the day. I didn't see as many of you, but certainly if you look at me, your eyes darken. Because there's a sense of oppression. There's a sense of really, I have to stick to a plan. I'm forced to be constrained to live within these parameters that I have to find for myself this day and not be free to whatever the, the road might lead, wherever the day might take me. There, there's a sense in which for some, this idea of planning is not in any way uh, something that brings security or confidence. It actually brings a bit of oppression. You can know which side you lean toward by this one simple thing. When you take a vacation, do you have every day planned? Or do you say, thank God there's no schedule? And if you have everyday plan, like I'm going to do this on Monday, this on Tuesday, this on Wednesday, you're a planner, and thank God and enjoy it. That's just who you are. Plans bring security. They bring confidence. They help you. If you're like me and the idea of a vacation is 10 days with nothing to do, whatever arises, arises, and things may go miserable because maybe I should have planned something. It might have been more fun. But whatever turns out, I'm going to live with it and enjoy it because I'm liberated from a schedule liberated from a sense that I have to do this, this, and this. So whether you love or hate planning, we all have to do it to some degree, even those of us who don't find it that interesting. And a plan is quite simple. If you just think about what a plan is, it's just a process to determine how you're going to get from point A to point B. It's just simply, how am I going to go from where I'm at right now and steward my resources and what I have and think about how I can get to point B, and your plan becomes more complex if point B is way off in the future, like I need to plan for my kid's college, or if your plan's very hard in point B, like I want to be able to shred guitar by the time I'm 65. I'm five years into my 12-year plan of shredding guitar. It's got another seven years to go before we see if it succeeds or fails. But there's a lot involved along the way. So I actually, he who hates playing, have this master plan to be able to shred to my heart's delight. We plan, we think about how we're going to allocate our resources to get from point A to point B. Because we know there's a good stewardship quality to that. That we're thinking about how we're going to invest what we have into a future that we desire to be. And we know that if we fail to plan, we plan to fail to borrow an axiom. So there's a lot of planning going on right now. You've received on Saturday or you received on Monday a letter from me asking you to think about your pledge for your service, for your support over the coming year that's to come. That involves planning. I've never had on my calendar more plans for surgeries and infusions and doctor's visits. It's just, you know, we're planning and we're trying to deal with the situation that I'm in. We're planning for services for Christmas already to think about how we'll handle this kind of new situation we'll be in for a few months. You're probably, especially if you're a planner, already got your holidays planned. You know where you're going, you know what meal you're going to have, or at least you're in the process of doing that. All of that's good. Planning helps us to face the future with confidence. But here's the secret, and you all know it. The future hasn't happened yet, and it may not in any way go according to your plans. It may completely say, what are these plans? And what have they to do with me? Because the future cares not for your plans. And when your plans don't succeed, when they fall apart, it might tend to make you think, well, I guess I should give up planning altogether because there's another axiom 
Um, he who, um, you want to make God laugh, took out your plants. And so we know that there's that certain axiom as well. And that's why I think the wisdom of Scripture is so wonderful. He gives a paradox to planning. It makes both the planners and the non-planners feel very comfortable. Because in one sense, it says it's wise to plan. That's a good thing to do. It's a wise way to live. Instead of doing things just impulsively, it's better to think out where you're going to go and how you're going to use your resources. But it also has another track. It's wise to plan, but things don't always go as planned. And so when things don't go as planned, one must be flexible and think about how you move forward when plans fail as you move forward with this awareness that there are two certainties to the future. One is that change is constant. And no matter how meticulously you plan, the environment, your circumstances, situations might change. I remember reading with glee a few months back a New York Times article that was predicting who would be in the Super Bowl this week, and they were using all the statistics from all the players and talking about who would be in the Super Bowl. And if you read that article, you're laughing with me. Because you know how stupid the article is just a few weeks into the football season. It said to my joy that the Packers and the Colts will be in the Super Bowl. The Packers and Colts. It's a dream game. It's a dream Super Bowl. It's the Super Bowl we're all longing for. And the New York Times declared affirmatively, if you look at the stats, that's who's going to be there. And we knew within week one or two, that's baloney. Uh, the planning... All it was done, it was done for naught. Because there's a certainty, and that certainty is things change no matter how meticulously you plan. The other constant, however, that I'd like to draw your attention this morning is that no matter where our plans take us, if they succeed or fail, the constant that God's love is from everlasting to everlasting, that God's presence remains with us when things fall, when they fail, when they're challenged, that that reality does not ever move away, and we must always keep that in mind if we're to live truly wise lives, if we're to lead lives that recognize God's presence and power in the midst of our situation, whether it's good or bad. So I want to just develop very quickly. I would like you to see there's plenty of Proverbs about planning, and you can see Proverbs that say, hey, you know, you ought to take counsel, you ought to have many advisors, you ought to think about your plans, talk to experts, think about your future and how you're going to get to point B with people who know you and understand you and know where you want to get. Make sure you're diligent in your plans because diligence is always good. It's much better than being hasty. Hasty is always seen as impulsive and foolish in the Proverbs of ancient Hebrew. Uh, there's a sense in which, you know, if you just kind of impulsively do things, you're not going to have a well-thought-out sense of where you'd like to go. So there's an affirmation of plans and of their value, but at the same time, there's this mystery. And this mystery is that the human mind plans the way, but it's Yahweh who directs the steps. So that we might have all kinds of plans that we've developed and, and we've put together, but in the end, it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. And, and the point here is not to say, hey, there's no use in planning. The point here is to say that there's a sense in which when we plan, we must never throw out that awareness that our plans might change, but God's presence does not. And we need to keep God in mind as we plan our future. It's like the psalm says, unless the Lord builds the house, our labor is in vain. We might be planning for something that has nothing to do with where God's leading is, where the Spirit is taking us. So we have this paradox, and this is all I want you to see in this simple short section, that plans are important, yet plans sometimes fail. And when they fail, we must remember the certainty that God is present in the midst of the change. And it seems to me that our reading from James does the perfect job of summarizing all this collective wisdom of the Proverbs of the ancient Hebrews. That he sees the tension. And he says very simply, you know, go ahead and make your plans. But in the midst of your plans, don't become so self-reliant and so presumptuous that you think just because you're planning something, it's going to happen. Because we're vulnerable, we're weak, we are frail, we, we don't even know what tomorrow might bring. And so what we need to say in the midst of making these plans, he doesn't in any way dissuade us from making these plans, but he says in the midst of it, we should constantly remember the presence of God. Constantly remember the Lord's will. So that we plan for the future without boasting, without self-reliance, without trusting in our plans more than we trust in God. And that happens a lot. 
where my plans are what I really trusted in, and God takes second base, where James wants to have a different layer. That he wants to say, you know, your best big plans might go awry, but when they do, you can trust in this. God's presence abides and remains. Henry Nowen has this wonderful, he was a professor in Harvard, and he spent the last few years of his life caring for a guy named Adam, who was completely and utterly disabled, and he never expected his life would lead to this. And in one of his final books, he says, while well, realizing that 10 years ago I didn't have the faintest idea that I'd end up where I am now, I still like to keep up the illusion that I'm in control of my own life. I do too. Uh, I, I, who don't really like plans in detail, Make plans nonetheless, because you have to in some way. And, and I planned as a teenager uh, to be a professional rock musician. I played for 8 to 12 hours a day. I, mean, I played and played and played, and I performed and I played and practiced, and I really was working at it. And that was my goal in life, only to see it fail. But thank God it failed, because I guarantee you, had I remained a professional rock musician, I would have lived to 25 at best. Uh, because at 21, I was already just about ready to spark out. I planned on being a Bible professor and a scholar. Once I came to Christianity, I thought, you know, I really want to study this thing, and I read widely and deeply, and I thought, my plan is I'm going to be a professor in a seminary or a Bible college, and yet the pastor at the first church I attended pulled me aside and made me his pastoral assistant, gave me pastoral duties, and now, thank God, my plans didn't succeed. Because being a pastor is so much better than being a professor. Planned on having two kids. But three are there. I'm so grateful for the third. I plan on my second pastor to be as long as my first. I served at College Park Baptist for ten and a half years. I was hoping to serve in Glastonbury, Connecticut for at least ten and a half years because only long pastors make a big difference in people's lives in my, my uh, awareness. I only lasted there two years because of financial hemorrhaging. It was one of the saddest, most difficult failures in my life, and yet it brought me here. I'm so grateful to have been here for 16 years. I mean, that plan that failed led to here. I didn't plan on getting leukemia before the transplant. We were monitoring and planning, and every month, every couple months, watching my blood work, and the plan was to get me to this procedure before leukemia hit, but that plan failed. And so what you have in this sense of thinking about God's presence, this awareness that, yeah, it's good to plan, and all of those things I plan, but when plans fail, it's good to remember that with that constant of change, there's another constant, and that constant is the mystery of God's providence. Now, I don't in any way pretend to comprehend or understand God's providence, but I do believe at the very least it means God is present when plans succeed and when plans fail. So that all our steps, Proverbs 20 and 24, are ordered by the Lord. How can we understand our own ways? How can we understand that there's another actor in our lives that is working within our lives, within our lives when things turn out how we plan them to be, and when things don't turn out as we plan them to be? That God is always connected to our plans, whether they succeed or fail. And that gives us at least the ability to look into the future that was not planned, to look in the present that was not planned, and to perhaps see that God's presence is even here. I've used this before, but it's so good, where, where Jesus in the shack talking to Mac, uh, says to Mac, you know, what are you afraid of, Mac? And Mac goes elaborately on all these fears that Mac has, that in the future he'll fail at this, or this won't come to fruition, or he'll never be able to deal with this tragedy that has occurred in his life. He just laments and laments about all the possible futures that are before him. And Jesus finally says to Mac, Mac, do you realize that your imagination of the future, which is almost always dictated by fear of some kind, rarely, if ever, pictures me there with you? That that doesn't seem to be a constant in your awareness or consciousness of your future. Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message, says, when you make your plans, don't leave God out of the formula. That is the only part that makes sense. And then that led me to think, you know, I've always thought this is an interesting, and I think helpful for the most part, quote, Joseph Campbell, who read the myths of, 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 of mankind, you must give up the life you plan in order to have the life that is waiting for you. Which he's not including God in the picture, but I would, and the idea is that there's always a constant 
in our plans and that when my plans fail to come through, the challenge of life is not to get over the failure, to get over the loss. You can't do that. You have to embrace it and, and assimilate it. So well, the plan, the, the, the challenge is how do you move forward in this new circumstance? How do you not miss out on the life that is before you because it's not the life that was planned? And I think James is trying to help us in this. He might be, be the best help, but it's his best way of helping. He's a bit crass. He's a bit blunt. He's a bit straightforward when he says, you know, don't be presumptuous. Don't leave God out of your plans. Be aware that the best of your plans might lead to nothing because you can't see with full confidence what is to come, what changes might occur. So when you do make your plans, always have this humility and ability to not be so self-reliant, but instead in humility to say, if the Lord wills, then this will occur. He is doing this to try to get us to be humble, to get us to embrace the life that has come, even if it perhaps is not the life that was planned. Brendan Manning has this wonderful statement, which, you know, if you're a planner, you hate this. And I'm not a planner, I don't like it until they get to the end. May all your expectations be frustrated, may all your plans be thwarted, may all your desires be withered into nothingness that you may experience the powerlessness and poverty of a child and sing and dance and trust in the love of God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. The thing I love about that prayer is, would we learn to sing and dance with joy and boldness and confidence in the presence and the love and the grace and the guiding of God if everything always went according to plan? Uh, or would we begin to trust our plans and say, you know, it really is my genius, my meticulous skill at coming up with this list of things to do. That's what's brought me success and wholeness and joy in life. Instead of knowing, no, that there's, there's another actor involved. So that we make our plans, but we don't trust in our plans. And we remember God is present, whether our plans succeed or fail. Which leads me to this conclusion. You heard Michelle read Psalm 23. You might think, why, why did we do Psalm 23? Is the opening passage. And the reason I wanted to use that is we have a saying in the UCC, no matter where you are in life's journey, you're welcome here. Let me modify that a bit, that no matter where you're on in life's journey, a table's been prepared. And the psalmist, I guarantee you, had no plan on being in the desert, in the valley of the shadow of death, Surrounded by lurking enemies where every shadow brought fear and disappointment, where there was this deep shadow of, of death and disappointment surrounding him or her. There was no planning on being there, but yet the psalmist in the midst of that dark, dark valley was surprised to discover that there was a table. And that table was a table of God's presence in the midst of spoiled plans. It was God's presence in the midst of Things that didn't succeed. It is something that is such a beautiful picture and something that we need to remember because there is a table in our wilderness. It will show up. It will arise. It will be present. It is the one certainty there in the midst of all of our other uncertainties and perhaps we can't take any joy or gain any comfort from it right now, but we will one day for God remains with mercy and goodness following us all the days of our life. And God is there in order to lead us into this awareness that no matter where our plans take us, that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Which is why we use this as our prayer of forgiveness, because I think James, uh, the psalmist says what James says, but with much more eloquence. You know, James just says, hey, all of this planning, don't get self-reliant, say if the Lord wills. You know, kind of like a, a schoolmaster, just that's what you need to do. Where the psalmist says this with beauty. Uh, with beautiful phrases of, you know, God has compassion on you, even knowing we're frail, we're mortal, mortal we're dust, we're, we're vulnerable, and in all our mortality, in all our vulnerableness, in all our sense of perhaps making plans that do not in any way come through, the one thing we need to know is that constant of change passes and leaves through our lives, that there's one other certainty that's not change. It is the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting, to everlasting, and it is that that we count on, whether our plans succeed or fail. Give just a moment for reflection, and then we'll join together in some prayers.
could be playing on that phone call. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who it was, but it's all right. At least those things happen. It's human. It's life together. I'm glad you're here. Don't don't be ashamed by that. Um, I got four prayers. One for wherever you're at. If you're a planner, if you lean more towards that, this is the prayer for you to help you think about what you can change and how you can change it, but to know there are limits to what you can do, and so think wisely about what you're going to choose to change, and in the midst of it, learn to appreciate the day as it is, your life as it is right now. It's the serenity prayer, and it makes sense that if you're an NA or AA, your challenge really is to figure out, what can I do? And I know I can't do everything, and my plans have been spoiled so many times, even by my own hand, that I need to to try to change what I can change and learn to be happy that one more day, one more day, one more day. So if this is where you're at, if you're on the planning side, I'll invite you to join me in praying this if you feel comfortable doing so. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference, living one day at a time, Enjoying one moment at a time, taking this world as it is and not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. It's a good one for planners. If you're like me and just plans are absolutely oppressive, then you pray this prayer more often than you'd like because without plans, you tend to get lost really easy. Uh, and I've used this over and over. This is probably the prayer I pray more in this congregation than any other prayer. And so if you lean more towards that side, I invite you to join in. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself, and the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you, and I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything Apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore will I trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen. So I thought of planners and I thought of non-planners and then I thought of people and there's there's some in our congregation and, and you might be there and just haven't even spoken it that are so completely sideswiped by life that even the promise of God's presence in the wilderness and the table just does nothing for you. And you just cling by a thread. And it's this beautiful prayer by Christine Fry where she takes the imagery from Psalm 23 and, and finds consolation in them, but it's a slim consolation, but it is this desperate attempt to try to keep one's head above water in the midst of it. And so um, I'm going to offer this prayer if you'd like to join in on this. This might be good for all of us to join in because who knows who's at this point. Lord, I know there must be valleys, but mine reach down to hell. Each time I climb to a mountaintop, I dread the valley on the other side. Fearing the valley, I cannot celebrate the mountaintop. I long for fertile plains, green pastures where I can catch my breath, where I can rest my spirit, where I can renew my resources before I must face the next mountain and the next valley. Lord, I long to celebrate life. I long to trust you more. Forgive me for not living the life you gave me. And give me courage to keep on trying. Amen. And then as our final prayer, it's really just what we've already prayed. And I always find that with some prayers, they mean more after we've reflected and thought on them a bit. So I invite you to join me in this and then I'll offer the pastoral prayers. God of our life. We confess that we do not always understand your ways. 
We are easily discouraged when life takes unexpected turns and our carefully laid plans and dreams come to nothing. We confess that we are quick to give up when things get difficult and quick to question your presence and your power. Forgive us, grant us patience to wait for your good timing. Open our eyes to recognize that you're leading in our lives. Open our ears to listen for your gentle whisper when we least expect it. And then give us courage to step out in faith and obedience, trusting in your leading, even when we cannot yet see the outcome. Amen. Thank you for participating in those with me. I'll offer this now as we intercede on behalf of the world. We pray for peace and justice to reign and for your spirit's presence to be with these whom we love and are thinking about. We think of Dave, Wolf, and Kathy, grateful that he's home, but praying for continued recovery and healing and strength and patience for him and Kathy and the family. We pray with great joy for the successful surgery for Ellery, grateful that that's going well. We pray for her continued healing and your strength in that family. Pray for Kent with his knee as he's experiencing setbacks. We pray that you give him strength and patience in the midst of this and that you bring him to full wholeness. Pray for my biopsy coming up tomorrow. Be present with me. May you be my strength. Give us wisdom as we move forward into this unknown future. And be with Jessica Frederick and Jeremy Walter as they also wrestle with their own cancer, cancer challenges. Be present with them. Bring them healing and wholeness, we pray. Then there are those who are not on this list, those we care for, those we love, those we're connected to or associated in some way. We pray that your peace would be with them, that your strength would accompany them, that you'd be present with them in the midst of whatever challenge they may face. Finally, we thank you for the gifts given in the giving church and pray and bless the gift of the giver. God, community, holy and one, as we draw near to you in this time, we lift the prayer that you've taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. For our final meal, I would invite you to stand with me if you're able, and we'll sing together God of Our Life, number 486.
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore.